the problem was, yes, there was a disease, but Poland was convalescing and it was mm. a convalescent um, sick man who was stabbed by, uh, murdered by uh, the neighbours. <laughs> In 1791, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth adopted one of the most avant-garde constitutions in the world, establishing a very progressive constitutional monarchy. And yet, in 1795, the Commonwealth would disappear, partition between Prussia, Austria and Russia. This contrast between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and its seemingly advanced political model and its total collapse means that the history of the Commonwealth is often ignored or mocked. But for nearly four centuries, the Commonwealth was a major actor in Central European politics, controlling at its peak somewhere between a third and a fourth of the European landmass with advanced political and religious rights for its time, and vibrant intellectual, economic and cultural conditions. We wanted to cover this fascinating history with two leading experts on the topic. On one side of the line we have Norman Davies, the Polish-Welsh Honorary Fellow at St Anthony's College, Oxford. He's also a Professor Emeritus at UCL, and the author of many books on Poland, including God's Playground, A History of Poland. On the other side of the line, we have Adam Zamoyski. For his third appearance on the podcast, he's the author of Poland, A History. As always, you can listen to the full episode by supporting us on Patreon. If you find yourself coming back most weeks to the podcast, it's a great way for you to show your support. Help us build the podcast and double your content every single week. Now, on to the show. Let's get straight into it. Um, Professor Davies, when and why was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth created and perhaps also how large was it at its peak? Uh, the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was <clears throat> created by the Union of Lublin uh, in 1569. Um, uh, it was... <clears throat> Uh, implemented on the death of the last Jagiellon and King of Poland, Sigismund August, in 1572. Um, uh, I can't tell you uh, exactly how big it was. It was more than two million square kilometres. Um, uh, no, five or six times bigger than Poland today. Um, in fact, when it uh, was launched, it was the largest state in Europe by far, mm. uh, consider considerably bigger than France or Germany. Uh, uh, the Russians at that time, the Muscovites, had not yet crossed the Urals. Of course, when um, the Russians started to cross the Urals and Eurasia, uh, that became... Uh, gradually the, the largest state in the world. Mm. Um, and uh, Muscovy was the eastern neighbour of the Commonwealth. Um, uh, this Commonwealth was made up of uh, several parts. Um, one was the Kingdom of Poland, um, which... Uh, in 1572 included the whole of present-day Ukraine and Ukraine in itself is the largest state in Europe today mm. um, uh, 
the largest state uh, entirely in, in Europe. Um, so, if you like, second after Russia. But I told you about the, the elements of, of making up the, the Commonwealth, um, the Kingdom of Poland, including Ukraine, the Grand Duchy, basically uh, modern Lithuania plus Belarus. Um, the third element was Prussia, um, something which most of our historian colleagues don't know about. They uh, assume that uh, Prussia was always part of Germany. Well, Prussia was a fief of the Kingdom of Poland between 1525, when the uh, Teutonic state was abolished, uh, and Prussia remained a fief of the Kingdom of Poland uh, until 1660, the Treaty of uh, Oliva. Uh, another smaller but important part was the Duchy of Courland, um, which is whose territory is uh, the western part of modern Latvia. Uh, the Duchy of Courland actually had some colonies for a brief time, uh, and some people boast that uh, the Commonwealth was, a, you know, a colonial mm. state. Um, I think the, the Duke of Courland owned at one time the Gambia in West Africa and oh, one or two other places, uh, being a small naval power. Uh, and then... Uh, there are one or two bits of piece, uh, pieces. Um, uh, at one time, the Commonwealth included uh, half of modern Estonia, uh, 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 Latvia, and, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Lithuania. Uh, am I right, Adam? Is there any more? Are there any more pieces? Um, yeah, no, you're right. And the only thing I'd say is that these boundaries were very fluid because um, you can't say that the whole of you present day Ukraine was in the Commonwealth because um, the, the Crimea never was, the Donbass never was, and um, left bank Ukraine, left bank of the Dnieper was really only pretty fluidly and loosely associated. Um, and um, uh, all right, nearly nearly uh, all Ukraine. Uh, I, I, yeah. I don't think of Crimea as being Ukrainian, but... Um, no, but, uh, yeah, so, but I mean, if we're talking about people, now I think of you yeah. know, Ukraine. But um, no, I, you're absolutely right. But the thing is, I think one has to bear in mind um, that um, all these... Uh, out in, in, in this part of the world... Um, you know, people staked claims to to areas which they didn't, in fact, totally control. Um, sometimes they claimed them through a vassal of some sort. Um, sometimes they claimed them outright. But uh, the Commonwealth never, as you well know, had an efficient military or policing capability. So um, uh, it it was loose control, um, which, again, I think um, the important thing to remember is that it, it was very much a voluntary association um, of... Um, nobles, uh, nobles, yes. <laughs> um, exactly. I mean, it was obviously led by their elites, um, but there was um, th there weren't kind of wars of conquest to to to, to create the um, the Commonwealth. It it sort of congealed <laughs> in its own way um, as various um, units and various elites of various parts. Um, decided that being part of the Commonwealth was probably the best bet. Um, very much for reasons, very varied reasons, sometimes security, um, simply because they thought that, you know, the local lord felt he would have more power 
and would have wouldn't have to pay such high taxes if you joined the Commonwealth rather than some other club. Mm. Uh, certainly another club such as Muscovy, um, mm. it, it, which would impose controls. So um, it, it's it's always very difficult to define, as Norman said, either in area um, or indeed in, 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 in time, because it kept um, changing in, in spatially, it kept changing because of local wars, local conquests, um, and indeed um, every unit uh, was a member on slightly different, uh, on a slightly different basis. You know, it's not like the membership rules were laid down in mm. stone. <laughs> it was a very, very loose club. It, it wasn't a set menu. Yes, and uh, which was, I think, a large part of its attraction. It's why mm. it did grow so much. Um, uh, it suited an awful lot of people. And it would have gone... I think what Adam is uh, stressing quite rightly is that um, most people think of this period from the mid 16th to the end of the 18th century as the age of absolutism. Mm. Uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was the great exception. It was mm. not uh, an absolute sense in state in any sense at all. It was very decentralized uh, and um, you know, the antithesis of what Louis XIV might do. Uh, well, but I think it's a good segue to the question I have, which is, how would you define actually the, the Commonwealth? Was it a, a republic? Was it an, a monarchy? Was it an empire? Um, and perhaps also how have this kind of, how has the understanding of the Commonwealth yeah. changed from its beginning towards to, to the okay. end, starting with Professor Davies? Well, um, the... Uh, the title of uh, the state was the Rzeczpospolita, which is the Polish translation of Latin Respublica. Uh, and uh, the, the name uh, derived, uh, you know, partly from ancient Rome, the ancient Roman Republic, uh, which uh, some of these Renaissance uh, Polish aristocrats thought they were recreating. Um, and partly from the Italian city-state uh, of the period, like 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 Venice, mm. um, uh, the, there were two parts, as I, two main parts: the Corona, the Kingdom of Poland, uh, and the Grand Duchy. But you also ma mentioned uh, the word empire. Mm. Um, uh, present day historians in various countries that used to belong to this uh, think of it as um uh you know occupied territory mm. uh, they they use the term polish empire which of course infuriates poles mm. <laughs> greatly because uh, one of the uh, qualities of it that it was as, as adam said voluntary mm. um the uh uh, Union of, of Lublin was a, uh, a voluntary uh, association uh, with a bit of um, uh, um, uh, hard persuasion from uh, from the king who was uh, who chaired the the long proceedings in the 1560s. Uh, but uh, uh, empire is one way of looking at it. It's uh, a, a large area over which. Uh, you know, the Polish system, uh, later the Polish language, uh, Polish culture uh, spread, uh, but it was not an empire in the, in the, the sense that we, uh, we think of uh, whatever the British Empire, the, the French Empire, uh, it was um, not like that at all. Mm. How do you understand the it's kind of unique blend because it's a monarchy, there's a king, yes. but it's um, also a republic. Um, no, it, it was essentially a constitutional monarchy, and that's what it was supposed to be at its foundation. Uh, the trouble was that in the 17th century, there was a huge tussle 
um, between the the forces of of um, on the one hand um, those who wanted it to be decentralized and very uh, and, and governed by the same by the parliament um, and the particularly the Vasa dynasty who ruled, um, who like, as Norman pointed out, like the rest of Europe, which was going, which was centralizing. When you think, you know, at the end of the Middle Ages in, in England, the Tudors um, brought in very centralized government and a very strong state um, with all the, um, um, you know, the, the oppression of a strong state. Um, so did the French. There was this tremendous tension between uh, the crown and the Fronde, and finally Louis XIV won and created a centralized state. Um, the, um, the Muscovites created a centralized state in the most ruthless manner uh, during the same period. And so did um, most uh, European states. And the Vasa kings of Poland, who ruled for the really from the last um, decade of the 16th to the um, 16th, uh, 16th century to the 1660s, were trying to centralize it and were just at odds with um, the forces, um, the kind of Republican inverted commas forces. But those Republican forces were very strongly dedicated to the idea of a monarchy. Mm. So though they were Republicans, they believed they were, you know, they were, they were in favor of a constitutional monarchy. And note that when the, the Jagellon dynasty died out, um, they elected um, Henry of, of um, Valois mm. and forced him to marry the um, very old and ugly um, niece of the last Jagellon king so as to give him legitimacy. Um, they then, when he ran away to France to take up the throne there, they then elected um, Stephen Battery of Transylvania and made him marry her too. Um, and the reason, well, one of the main reasons why they chose the Vasas was because they were, um, they had married into the Aguilon uh, dynasty. And so there was continuity. And then they chose three Vasas in a row until mm -hmm. they died. Um, and then they kept trying to, to find another dynasty. And, one, one absolutely fascinating fact is that when, in 1796, John Sobieski, John III Sobieski died, he wasn't buried for a year and a half until the next king had been crowned. Mm. The idea of a break in the royal chain, the, you know, the concept of le roi est mort, vive le um, was somewhere um, still um, uh, uh, still still present in their mm. thinking. So it, it was neither a republic um, nor a um, a, a, a absolute monarchy, but it was. It, and and this was indeed, I think, what destroyed it was that the the Vasas in particular didn't understand that they were supposed to work through the parliament and were at loggerheads with it. And, and that's what, where I think Poland's decline, um, because it couldn't work, because mm. it, 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 it divided the two forces which were supposed to work together as, as they should in any successful um, constitutional monarchy. Well, we'll go back to the, to the decline later on, but I think- um, could, Professor could Davies I... said, Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, and just sticking with words, uh, uh, Adam's quite right, a constitutional monarchy, but it wasn't, 
a monarchy in the way we think that most people think monarchies are hereditary, mm. uh, whereas the monarchs of the Commonwealth were elected and elected in a very peculiar way, namely uh, every nobleman from a, across this enormous territory had the right to be present on horseback uh, at the royal election. And uh, according to the um, uh, the various elections, you know, 10, 20, th even 30,000 noblemen uh, on horseback, fully armed, would turn out turn out on a, a great field outside Warsaw uh, and they would stick at it until they um, they decided who uh, the next uh, elected monarch would be. Um, but it didn't work too badly. Um, uh, they had very bad luck. The first monarch, um, Henri Valois, um, when he uh, um, inherited the French throne, um, uh, disappeared uh, and never returned. Um, and there had to be another election. Uh, but uh, after him, uh, Stefan Batori, who was the Prince of Transylvania, turned out to be one of the uh, more successful and efficient uh, monarchs. Um, and uh, you know, so it went on. The last election was in uh, 1763, right? 1764. Um, and the last <clears throat> king of Poland, Lithuania, uh, reigned until he was forced to abdicate by the Russians and carted off um, as a prisoner in 1795. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the height of the influence of a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. How avant-garde was it on political rights, on religious minorities? Um, was this truly an exception um, compared to the rest of Europe, starting Professor Zamoyski? Uh, well, I think it was because it, um, it it was founded on some uh, very uh, modern, very enlightened ideals. Uh, to what extent these ideals were always enacted is another question. But the um, the essence was um, of um, of great personal freedoms of the individual, of course, not of um, the lower orders of society uh, who were bound in all sorts of um, straight jackets as they were all over Europe, but of the very large um, body of, of, of the people who are the, the citizens of Poland, the, 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 this minor gentry. Um, and, a, a tremendous sense of um, the, um, you know, there was a, the very early Polish tradition of Neminem Captivabimus, which is the Polish version of, of um, habeas corpus, um, of personal freedoms uh, that couldn't be trampled by the state particularly, um, and a, a legal system which functioned most extraordinary actually reading legal documents in in the provinces at a moment when the state is described by foreign travelers as barely existing mm. and um and and poland is weak and in full decline and yet um the local tribunals carry on functioning in um, a remarkably efficient way with judges elected by the local gentry um, and those local tribunals manage to raise local militias to keep order and, and so on. Uh, and the, um, you know, the actual delivery of justice is, is pretty good, in fact. So mm. there were all sorts of ways in which it, it, there was a tremendous, underlying it all, there was a tremendous sense of civic pride in the whole enterprise. And however misguided and, and in some cases um, dim 
uh, many of these backwards nobles were, they all, they would, you know, at every possible opportunity, they would trumpet the great virtues of the Polish system and the Polish freedoms as they saw them. The fact that they themselves would occasionally trample those freedoms um, and um, were unruly and so on is, is another here nor there. But there, there was underlying the enterprise, there was a, a, a great, um, a, a great pride in it, wouldn't you say, yeah. Norman? Um, that, that they would, they would, um, um, and they thought that their system was better than that of neighboring nations. Um, and they regarded their brother nobles in neighboring nations as, as being treated like slaves, whereas they were free. And um, so, um, and, you know, it, it, there's some, um, I forget his name, one of the, um, it's either James Harris or, or Raxall, but a British diplomat in the 1770s, when Poland is in full decline, um, having spent some time in Prussia um, at the court of um, Frederick the Great, considered one of the great enlightened monarchs, comes to this chaotic country, Poland, and writes, I, I paraphrase the quote, he says, I rejoiced at being able to breathe the air of freedom mm. entering this republic. Uh, so there was something there uh, which, which you could regard as progressive and, 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 and modern. Uh, certainly um, quite well, entirely unique. Nothing, nothing else like it anywhere else in in, in Europe. And there's something else I think maybe um, Professor Davies could give us an insight on is also the unusually diverse religious and ethnic makeup of the yeah. Commonwealth. Yes, I, I was going to say the um, uh, one of the um, stereotypes, you know, is that Poland uh, is and was Catholic. Well, um, uh, this is not. Uh, true of the um, of the Commonwealth, uh, the uh, religious pluralism was was very strong. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church was uh, was strong in the um, you know historic uh, Poland, uh, but a larger part of the Commonwealth uh, had a, an Orthodox population, mm. though not. Um, as most Westerners would think, Russian Orthodox. These were Orthodox who still recognized the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, ahead of the, if you like, the Greek Byzantine church. Uh, and they were um, fiercely opposed to the, um, the, Ru the Russian version of uh, Orthodoxy, which... Uh, the Muscovites uh, consistently tried to impose on um, on fellow Slavs. Uh, as a result of this um, uh, divisions among the Orthodox, one branch of them created a new church in 1595, uh, the Greek Catholic Church or Uniate Church, which retained the Orthodox rite, the old church Slavonic right, uh, but accepted uh, the Roman Pope as patriarch. Uh, and this community, um, which is still quite strong in, in Western Ukraine, was anathema to the Russians. Uh, every time uh, Russian forces um, uh, impinged on the Commonwealth, they tried to forcibly convert the uh, the Greek Catholics. Um, Protestantism was also widespread, especially in the uh, the early years, the uh, early uh, the late 16th, early 17th century, especially among the nobility of Lithuania. Mm. Some of the you know the biggest aristocrats like the Rajivils um, were turned Protestant, Calvinist. Um, uh, uh, Prussia, of course, was Lutheran. Mm. Uh, 
And then, uh, of course, the one of the features of the Commonwealth was the very large Jewish community, mm. uh, which um, uh, originated in the Kingdom of Poland, but was expanded into uh, Ukraine uh, and Lithuania, um, Belarus uh, in modern times. And this is a feature, of course, which didn't exist in, in Russia. There were no Jews in Russia until the partitions. Um, and and forget- then uh, the last one would be Islam, of course. The, yeah. uh, was, um, the, the southern parts of the Commonwealth bordered the, uh, the lands of the Tatars. Crimea. Crimea was the homeland of the Ukrainian Tatars, who were Muslims. And quite a number of Tatars ended up uh, being settled um, in uh, parts of Poland and Lithuania. So you had a very wide mix. Uh, and um, it's, I think, notable that um, the uh, religious conflicts uh, among these different communities was relatively uh, limited. The, mm. uh, in 1572, right at the beginning, uh, the Polish nobles um, uh, formed an association which swore not to uh, go to, not to create conflicts over over religion. Uh, of course, in time, when uh, uh, the Commonwealth was invaded by the Swedes, who of course were Protestants, uh, that very much strengthened the Catholic. Uh, element of, of of parts of Poland and then the wars with Muscovy who were um, uh, Orthodox um, uh, created you know uh, religious troubles on on that front but um, uh, you no know, domestic religious um, quarrels were relatively few and far between if, uh, if we are I think I should also yeah. add that um, because uh, every nobleman had uh, control over his own estate, it was very difficult for the religious courts to uh, enforce rules. Uh, you know, the Bishop of Krakow could uh, uh, hold a, a court case and declare somebody a heretic, mm. but it was almost impossible to catch the guy because he would simply... Uh, take off to the, the nearest uh, noble estate and uh, be immune from uh, from punishment. So the uh, the whole society was, uh, as it were, used to tolerate each other's differences. Mm. And I think it's quite striking that throughout this conversation, the question of the decline always comes up because um, as it lasted for a very long time, but in the end, the collapse was quite spectacular. Um, Professor Davies, how did it collapse? Is it a case of it dying of illness or was it a case of murder? If you want to listen to the rest of this conversation, including plenty of insights on Russia's centuries old attempts to undermine Poland and how that is shaping the war in Ukraine, you can subscribe for as little as five euros a month to essentially double your weekly content of uncommon decency. Talk to you then. So, Professor Zamoyski and Professor Davies are both out, and it's just me this week. There's been too many scheduling issues with the team, unfortunately, so I am so sorry. You're going to have to be sticking around with me for the next few minutes, but um, fret not. I do think I've got some interesting things to add to the conversation, and I'm so grateful they both came because we had uh, Adam a few times before, a few times before, and he was very insightful. And uh, we wanted to do this because actually I've been reading in the past few days uh, Professor Zamoyski's book on the um, on on Poland, which is very interesting. It got me fascinated with the topic. Posted about it on Twitter. There's a lot of engagement about it, and people told me you should you should talk to Professor uh, Davies. So that's how we got this uh, very insightful conversation. I I want to add a few things which I've, I thought was quite interesting. 
Um, this is something we talked a lot in the Patreon section, but it's the Polish mindset towards Russia and the kind of constant suspicion that Russia is meddling in democratic uh, processes, not just in Poland, but across the world, and in America especially. And I think that's really something they inherited from the Commonwealth because you've got this, you know, the, the warped Liberum veto, which became a tool for foreign powers to be able to block uh, any improvement, uh, any reforms. And all of a sudden you get countries like Prussia, you get countries like Austria and Russia um, paying out, bankrolling different uh, representatives to block the whole system. And I really think the parallels must be quite strong nowadays in the way that Poland thinks about Russia. Something else which I thought was quite interesting is, um, which I, I, I took from the book from, from Professor Zamoyski, it's on Prussia. It's such an incredible irony that originally it was, the, you know, the Polish kings asked for the Teutonic Order to settle in the region to be able to fight against uh, uh, pagan tribes of the north of Europe. And in the end, this invitation of the Teutonic Order ended up being the biggest fall in Polish history because the Teutonic Order would later on become the Prussian state and obviously the Prussian state would later um, take over the whole of Germany and you know, the, rest, the rest is history. And I just find it so interesting that, you know, Teutonic Knights, um, then Prussia, were always either rivals or subjects of the Polish uh, crown and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And in the end, you know, they, they took over. Another thing which I thought was quite insightful as well is something on language. I, I, was, um, I was listening to Professor Davies. He was doing another podcast on BBC, which I thought was quite interesting. And it's about how... Poland in the 15th, especially 16th century, was quite well integrated in the academic, cultural, uh, intellectual landscape of Europe. You know, the work they would do would be uh, translated. It would, it would travel quite widely. Also, you know, political theory and Copernicus, of course, is one of the great thinkers of the time from Poland. So you're talking about a state which is very much integrating those conversations and then all of a sudden you get something which um which changes completely the landscape which is all of a sudden latin no longer becomes the lingua franca or, or a lot less so and then you get a situation where polish work you know there's, there's an effort to develop the polish language just like there's an effort in france to develop french language and so on across europe and all of a sudden now you get a polish language which is very removed, very far, far removed from any of the Romance languages, for example, who had a lot in common. And you get this kind of incredible phenomenon, or because because all of Europe has abandoned this lingua franca, your your knowledge is being segmented again and is no longer able to travel. So I thought that was quite um, quite insightful as well to think about it. And something else which is interesting about Poland, and we didn't talk about, and I'll kind of wish we'd talked a little about was its decisive role in saving Vienna in 1683 when the Ottoman legions were pouring up towards Vienna surrounding the city laying siege to it and the defenders were getting increasingly desperate and who came in apparently out of nowhere um I, I, my understanding actually is this scene inspired Tolkien and the charge of Rohirrim it's the Polish cavalry, um, the infamous winged lancers, although they didn't actually have winged lancers, but so, so, yeah, uh, came in and saved the day. So I thought, you know, it's quite interesting that it was in a hermit kingdom. They were definitely a huge political player in the region. And the way they balanced out the emergence of Russia for a very long time and contained Ottoman um, aggression in the Balkans is something which is very insightful on the political role they played. But anyways, that's all for me. I'm starting my new job on Tuesday, so I might be a little less active in the next few weeks or so. But we have so many very exciting projects in the works, including a documentary project we have in mind. So this is quite exciting. 
If you want to listen to the full episode with a Patreon section, you can join us for as little as five euros a month. And we would really love, it's a good way for you to show your support if you've been listening for a long time. It really allows us to uh, keep growing and hoping for the best down the road. So um, I guess I'll see you all next week then.